just want to start by asking, what is the best gift you have ever been given, and what made it so? Okay, May is kind of a big month for gift giving in, in our house. My husband rolls his eyes because it's actually really hard on him. Mother's Day and then my birthday always fall, you know, one week after the other. And so he feels like the pressure is on to find the greatest <laughs> gift. But I have to tell you, he is so good. I, I'm a horrible gift giver. I want to, but I struggle when it's time to shop for people. I get stressed out. But Lauren just seems to have this ability to find things that surprise me, that delight me, that are necessary or useful in some way. And they tend to bless. They tend to bless other members of our family or they're things that we can all enjoy. And I, and I give thanks for that. But today, then, we think about the birthday of the church. We think about Pentecost. And so for the church on its literal birthday, God, who is the ultimate gift giver, fulfilled his promise by sending us his Holy Spirit to baptize Jesus' disciples then at that first Pentecost, 50 days after our Lord ascended. And so we're going to take a look today at what it means, what happened then, and what happens today, because God continually sends his Holy Spirit to us. So let's just get a little bit of background here in our text. I'm mainly going to be focusing on our readings in Acts chapter 2 and then also 1 Corinthians 12, but just a little bit of background for the Acts passage. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told the apostles to wait in Jerusalem. And they were to wait, and then they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and then they would be his witnesses to the end of the world. Now, this was a huge task, but God knew exactly what they needed to accomplish that. So he sent them to the Holy Spirit. And this was a gift. It was a gift that truly surprised them. It was uh, he, the Holy Spirit, was absolutely necessary for them to actually fulfill the mission that Jesus had given them. And he would keep on giving everything that they needed to fulfill that command. So as we think about this, then again, let's look at what happened then when God sent his spirit. What did the Holy Spirit do then? And what does he do for us now? And how does he help us, including us here at St. John's, fulfill his command for us. So first of all, when God sends his spirit, things are created. Physical life is created. We looked at our psalm this morning, Psalm 104, and in verse 30 it tells us that when God sent the spirit, things things were made. When he sent his it's also translated as breath. When he sent his breath, things were created. And of course, we think about the Holy Spirit being present um, in Genesis at the beginning of the creation story. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So things are created physically when God sends his spirit, but also spiritually. And in John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus that to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And this is by water and by the Holy Spirit. And that life is breathed into us is something that we see in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospel of John. John uses this word for life, zoe, and it's the kind of life that only God has in himself. And so when God sends the Spirit, it breathes the life, it breathes the life that God has in himself into us when we are born again. So when God sends his Spirit, things are created physically and spiritually, but also corporately. And we have body life, this thing that we call the church. And in our passage in Acts chapter 2, we see that the disciples then are gathered. And we don't know exactly who was gathered. Scholars differ on that. Not sure if the, if the people referred to are maybe the 120 that were referred to in the first chapter of Acts. But there's a group of people gathered, kind of like we are, but they're gathered in a house. And as these disciples of Jesus are gathered, the Holy Spirit comes. And we're going to look more closely at that here in a minute. But he comes... And what ends up happening as he comes with this sound like a wind and people see things like tons of fire that come to rest on people, they have the ability to speak in other languages. And the narrative goes on into Acts where Peter ends up standing up and preaching. And a result of his preaching of the gospel, there are 3,000 souls added that day to their numbers. So we see this growth of the thing that we call the church. So when God sends his spirit, these things are created. Secondly, when God sends his spirit, 
spiritual gifts are given. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about this. I have to tell you, I love uh, studying and teaching on spiritual gifts because it was a game changer for me as a Christian. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But we're primarily going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 13. Now, just to give you a brief overview of spiritual gifts, this is one of about three or four other major passages in the Bible that talk about spiritual gifts. The others are in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4. And in addition to the gifts that we see named here in the passage that Jan read just a little while ago in 1 Corinthians 12, there are additional gifts in those other passages. And somewhere between maybe 17 to about 19 different gifts are named in Scripture. And in 1 Peter 4, we see those divided up into two different, two big categories. We have primarily speaking gifts or serving gifts, meaning speaking, you're primarily using your mouth, and serving, you're primarily using your hands in ministry. And we see other gifts besides the ones that we heard this morning. We see the gifts of apostleship, prophecy, evangelism, teaching, exhortation, those primarily having to do with the mouth, right? Those would be speaking gifts. Then leadership, service, giving, mercy, administration, and the gift of helps. And it's important to note that these are all supernatural giftings because they are made possible only by the Holy Spirit. So as we look here, I don't know if you want to get your notes out that you have there in your bulletin to see in 1 Corinthians 12, but we'll see some repetition here in verses 4, 5, and 6 where Paul writes, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, also translated effects, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So we see repetition of varieties, same, varieties, same. Varieties of gifts, service, and activities or effects, but the same Spirit, Lord, and God. And the words that Paul uses there we see for the, for the name of God as spirit, as Lord, and as of God. He's using three Greek words that, would, that are meant to point us to the Trinity. So we see here in these varieties, we see one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see this unity in diversity. And to, to get back to looking here then at gifts, ministry, and effects, just kind of a brief definition. Obviously, you have the gift, right? So, for example, I'm exercising right now a teaching gift. It's my primary spiritual gift that I have. But I can use that gift in various ministries in different ways. It might be in the pulpit. Primarily, in my lifetime, it's been in a classroom setting. It could be in a home. I've used it on television or video in those ways. So there are different ways, different ministries in which you might use your spiritual gift, whatever that gift is. And then there are the effects, or what God does with that. That's something that God does. It's not my business what he does with it. But he takes what I offer through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he does that. So we see these varieties and same, and then in that varieties and same again, I don't want this to be lost on us, because we see this here in all the passages that we read this morning in Acts and First Corinthians. There is this unity that comes in diversity, and it comes because of the Trinity. Now think about that. That is one of our big problems today, isn't it? How in the world do we find unity in diversity? In fact, the word university, our universities were founded. Some of you might teach at a university. Initially, that was to find unity in diversity. And as we see here again, that is only found in the Trinity. So as we see this gift that God has given us, that is one profound thing that the Holy Spirit brings, is he allows us to have unity and diversity of who we are as people, and also in these spiritual gifts that he gives us. There is a unity there that's found. Okay, so in these spiritual gifts that are given, we move on to verse 7 here, and it says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So to each. So every person who is born again, who receives the Holy Spirit, He's regenerated and given that Zoe life. To each one, you are given at least one spiritual gift, but usually more. I have one primary gift but I have, that's in operation most of the time. That's my focus. But I have some other gifts, too, that God 
God uses as he wills. So you each have at least one. And it's important to note, this is a manifestation of the Spirit. Now think about the way the Spirit was made manifest at Pentecost. I don't know the Holy Spirit to be seen. God the Father was manifest at creation. He's manifest um, in sending his son Jesus, God in human flesh. But also the Spirit is made manifest at Pentecost where we see something like tongues of fire coming and, and the wind was heard. But today, the Spirit is seen or made manifest through these spiritual gifts because they are supernatural in their nature. We're not talking about natural born talents. Now, God can take and use our talents, absolutely, and that can sometimes, sometimes be a clue to our gifting, but definitely not always. It is something that is supernatural because it is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And in Pentecost, people who were from Galilee were able to speak in these other languages they had never learned. So this isn't something that you learn, but this is something that is given to you by the Holy Spirit. And so we see that, um, that manifestation individually, but it is for the common good. So it's for the benefit of other people in common. And so while we see this benefiting us as individuals, it's important to see then how this actually worked, how it looked as it spread and it was meant to bring the body together, to bring this unity and also to be seen in this thing we call the church. I don't use my spiritual gifting just off on my own. I'm not a lone ranger. That's not, in fact, that's not a good idea for a number of reasons, but that wasn't the intention of the gift. It was meant to be used in the context of my church family to hopefully bless within and serve within, but also without. So whatever spiritual gift you're given or gifts you're given, that's where it's intended to be used, in this thing that, I guess, that we call the church, but also it blesses people within and without. I want you to think about the human body. In fact, Paul goes on. I'm not going to get into that too much because that might be for next week's sermon. I'm not sure I would look, but that's later on in what we, than what we read this morning. But he goes on to talk about this illustration of the body. And you think about this. Your individual body parts on their own are really miraculous in their working. Let's just take the heart or the brain and how miraculous that is just on its own. But what really makes it miraculous to us is we see how it works and affects, but you can't really see the full effect until you see it in the context of how it works in the whole body. And it's the same thing with our spiritual gifts. This body has to work together. Um, we don't have any one person or one gifting that is um, able to really function full on its own. We need all of us together. So when we see all of the parts of the body working together, if you talk to anyone who really studies medicine, and even if they um, don't claim to be a Christian, they would say, and I've talked to many people like this, that even like said are not believers, they say, man, the more I study the body, the more I learn. I just think there has to be an intelligent designer behind it. It's just too miraculous to be an accident. But when people see the body of Christ functioning in that way, I think it does the same thing. And it's meant to be a manifestation of the Spirit so people can see it to ultimately point to God. So we see here then God sending his Spirit. It cre creates life. Things are created. But also we see these different ways that the body ultimately that he's created glorifies him. And let's get back to this passage here in 1 Corinthians 12. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But it's important to note then that since this is a supernatural work, that it is empowered, your gifting is empowered by God himself. It says it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. And then later on in verse 11, it says all these, all these gifts are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So let me just mention that real quick. It's as he wills. We don't necessarily ask, we don't ask for these gifts. They're given according to the will of God the Holy Spirit. He in his wisdom knows what a body needs, right? We don't need two heads and two feet and all that kind of thing. But he knows how a healthy body looks and he looks at this whole picture of the church of the body of Christ. He knows how many hands and how many feet and how many heads and how many mouths and so forth that are needed. So we're given these gifts by the will of God. Bless you. 
And they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Again, these are supernatural things. They're not learned. Now, we do develop them. That's true. But they are given by him. They're not our just natural talents. Again, going back to the example of the Galileans that are speaking in other languages they never learned. That's going to make so miraculous. If we look at the empowering, let's, let's take Peter, for example, who was there at Pentecost preaching boldly. Let's think about Peter's before and after when the Spirit came. Before, we saw Peter, who frequently had his foot in his mouth, it seemed like. And I can just really relate to that. I love to see that about Peter. But Peter also was the one who denied his Lord when he said he wouldn't. But now, Peter, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, Peter lifts his voice, and he preaches boldly. And the very Jewish leaders that he had been afraid of, that had led him to deny Christ, now he is preaching and calling them to repent. And he is preaching boldly. And the Spirit has empowered him to do that. And so we see the difference that that makes when we realize we're not leaning on our own talents and our own abilities. It's not about that at all. It is, it is receiving that gift that God has given that we need so much. And finally, again, it says here in this passage, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And, you know, as we look at this, how it blesses people inside the church and outside the church, when it comes, I'll just give the example of the speaking gifts. For example, the gift of teaching. In Ephesians 4, it tells us, that who are teachers or people who are part of this equipping ministry, we're to equip members for ministry. But also, there's, there's, so there's a, a kind of a, a benefit to the body inside the church, but also outside. Um, if someone's an evangelist, they're going to help people within the body and encourage them in, ev in evangelism, but also they'll go out. They'll go outside the church because they want to bless people who don't yet know our Lord. And so we bless and we serve in both ways. And, and when we do all of this, it brings me kind of to the next point. When God sends his spirit, God is glorified. So again, when God sends his spirit, things are created, spiritual gifts are given, and he is glorified. So, of course, we see how God is glorified at creation. I've already mentioned that. But let's just look at these passages here. Then in that first Pentecost, you've got, because these people, these Galileans, are speaking in these languages that they haven't learned, they're just given this supernatural ability, so it catches people's attention. And this multitude gathers. This multitude gathers, and it tells us they were bewildered, amazed, and astonished. Because they knew that there was something else at work here besides man's natural ability. And this ultimately led God being glorified. It's clear he was doing something. Now, when we see this body of Christ working together in this supernatural way, it demands an explanation. When we see this body of Christ working in ways that bless the members of our church family, but also bless others, it leads to, uh, there's a demand for an explanation of our lives and of how this is working. And we pray that ultimately it points to God and it glorifies him. And that we, like those first believers, get to proclaim the mighty works of God. And to make disciples, as Jesus commanded us to do. So all of this seems like a big task. In fact, quite frankly, it's impossible on many levels. But yet we see that God allowed it to happen for those first believers then. And he does want it to happen today. So how does all of this work? So I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon that, that learning about spiritual gifting and, and what the Spirit does when God sends the Spirit was really a game changer for me because I'm a church girl. I've grown up going to church my whole life. Even before I was born again and really filled with the Spirit, God was just calling me and working in me and working on me. But I would accept callings in church or I would be asked to serve in different ways. And I have to tell you, I just... I, I wasn't blessed by it, and I'm convinced I didn't bless anybody. I mean, really. <laughs> I was doing things I had no business doing because I just didn't know. And I'm the type of person that has a hard time saying no. So if someone asks me to do something, I feel like I've got to say yes. Now, I will say briefly, that doesn't mean that even when we find what our spiritual gift is, 
it doesn't mean that I don't ever step, I mean, there are times we just meet needs, right? Regardless, we just serve, but I'm just talking about your regular, normal, what, what you're operating in regularly, what your focus is. And I blessed no one, and I felt burdened by what I was being asked to do, I felt drained by it, and I don't think anybody was having a good time. So it was such a game changer for me when, and I knew I, I knew I could speak, but I thought I was more of like a motivational speaker, and I would be asked to go and speak at various events or conferences, and you know, recently I came across an old newspaper clipping, I was going through some stuff, and I'd forgotten about this, but I was asked to give a, a keynote talk at the University of Utah for some type of a series they were doing, and I look back, I was probably like, what, 26, 27 years old? I didn't come to know the Lord until I was about 28. And I just cringe. I'm like, oh my goodness, what did I say to those people? I mean, what in my, all of my wisdom could I have said? It, it kind of embarrasses me to think about it. But I just didn't know about any of this or how I was to be used. But God has taken that and just transformed it and shown me how, what it meant to have a spiritual gift. And it really started with, with my pastor. And I think this is important. We discover these gifts in the context of our, of our church family. But my pastor asked me if I would teach an adult Sunday school class. And I was like, really? And, and I had had a little bit of experience in, um, in Bible study, but not a lot. Um, but he said, you know, yeah, I really want you to teach this class, and I can help you with it and get you started. And I was like, really, are you sure you want me to do it? And he said, teaching is your spiritual gift, and it's time you started using it. I don't know how in the world he knew that, but the Holy Spirit had helped him discern that. And so when I started to make that shift and realize, oh, maybe that's why I like to study so much. Maybe that's why I'm starting to geek out over word studies and Greek and Hebrew words and stuff. Not that I speak those, but I like to do those types of word studies. I love to really dive deeply into scripture. Um, and all of that, and then tell people about what I've learned. And so somehow he discerned that. So that can be a clue for you if you're wondering what your gifting might be. Um, ask your pastor, pray about it, ask for discernment, because if you're in Christ, you have at least one spiritual gift. And so that really was a huge thing for me. It helped me to understand why I didn't do well at these things and why I liked to do these things. And then once I could focus my energies in developing as a teacher, and I did, I went and got help from people who were um, well-respected Bible teachers in our area, and I started going to trainings and to conferences, and I just started doing a lot more to develop that. It was a huge blessing to me, and I started to realize that when I'm operating my spiritual gifting, I am energized, and it's just something I love to do. So I pray that maybe that helps you a little bit if you kind of wonder about how God might be calling you uh, to serve and to manifest, or if you want to, to manifest that gift of the Holy Spirit that you have been given. Um, so that's just one part of it. And, and I think it's important, again, to realize we're not relying on natural born talents or even on our gift. When I've tried to do that, I have fallen flat on my face. And sometimes that's a good thing because it humbles us and then God can use us. But, but it's important that we realize it really is this matter of we are allowing the Holy Spirit to work in and through us for the glory of God. And if we look at what Jesus said, when we think about some things that he instructed the disciples about abiding and bearing fruit and how all this would work, in John 14, one of my favorite passages, he talks about how greater works than these will you do, meaning greater works than what Jesus did. Because he was going to go away because he's gonna send the Holy Spirit and so it's through Jesus working in and through us that we do these greater works. And then in John 15, he talks about abiding in him. Abide in me and I am you, for, because apart from me, you can do nothing. So he wants us to do this, though, because when we bear fruit, it glorifies the Father. And then, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, like, go. You can tell I'm a frustrated Bible teacher. It's just been too long. I want to ask all of your Bibles at right now. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it even talks about our salvation in that context, that we're saved not by works, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in. So that's a comfort, that it's not up to me to try to sit around and figure out, oh my goodness, how am I going to serve God? What in the world am I going to think of to do for him? He has prepared good works in advance for me that I should walk in them. And as I abide in Christ and Christ in me, as I'm walking with Jesus, he's going to make sure that 
that I don't miss that because I walk into those works. And he does the same for all of us. I love the fact that while we can be so transactional, God is relational. We like methods and I like to-do lists and all that. But it's ultimately, it's about that relationship with him. Okay, so in closing, when God sends his spirit, just like he did at Pentecost and does today, you see, things are created, whether physically, spiritually, or this body, life, this corporate life. When God sends his spirit, spiritual gifts are given that we use for his glory. Because when God sends his spirit, God is glorified. He is glorified. So now if I were to ask you, what is the best gift you have ever received, ever? As great as a gift giver as my husband is, nothing can ever compare to that gift that God has given us. It will never grow old. It will never wear out. It will ever not fit. It will ever, not ever not be useful. He has given us, God in his love, the ultimate gift giver, has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that things are created, spiritual gifts can be given and used and received, and that he can be glorified. So I pray that our response would be to do, what do we do when we get a gift? Because it's a really good gift. We just receive that, and we give thanks for it. And it delights the gift giver when he sees us using that gift and enjoying that gift and using it. So like those first believers at Pentecost, I pray that we also would take in that spirit and that we would turn around and proclaim the mighty works of God. Amen. 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 Let